Hi, everyone. Um, before we get started, I personally just wanted to thank everyone for virtually being here with us. I know we're all living through some difficult, some weird times. Um, but my name is Rosie. I'm currently a senior at USC studying philosophy, politics, and law with a minor in consumer behavior. I've always had an interest in law and the educational aspect of it, which leads me to why I even started or wanted to do the introduction of this presentation. So before we start, I, I will share my screen so you could see, but before we start, I'm basically just going to provide a roadmap of today's presentation. And then Mr. Amster, our criminal defense attorney will take it from there. But I'm only going to touch upon the main roles within the court system, um, briefly talk about their significance, and define them, and then Mr. Amster will take it from there. So with that, I will begin. Just give me one second, I need to share. Can everyone see my screen? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, okay, perfect. So the title of our presentation is, So You Want to Be a Lawyer? And the first thing that I'm going to talk about is who is essentially in the courtroom. We have the judge, the jury, our prosecutor, and the criminal defense attorney. I'm sorry for that. I should have. Oh, no, where'd it go? Sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Right. So just to reiterate, we have the judge, the jury, the prosecutor, and the criminal defense attorney. The judge is in charge of maintaining order within the court. And um, ultimately, they decide, they impose the sentencing for the individual who is on trial. Um, the jury, it's, the jury is a little bit more difficult because it varies by state. But in California, juries are made up of 12 individuals. And there are ordinary people within the area of where the trial is held. It's really important to note that the jury is not composed of members from the court system. The reason for this is because you always want to have a fair and, an, fair and impartial jury. You don't want the jury to discriminate the person who's on trial. Um, and then you have the prosecutor. Now, the prosecutor opposes the criminal defense attorney. They work for either an individual or for the government, depending on the type of prosecutor that they are. But ultimately, they're obligated to believe in the truth of their case. So that being said, if they believe that the person who is on trial is guilty, they will also attempt to demonstrate that to the jury. Um, the criminal defense attorney and you can ask Mr. Amster some personal or more in-depth questions once it once we get to him, but just more of like a, in simple terms, they're lawyers who specialize in defending the individual who's been charged with criminal activity. Essentially, they represent and speak on their behalf during the trial. Some Some examples of the type of criminal activity that they could defend would be assault, battery, that has to do with physical, um, physical touch, kidnapping, and so forth. There are different courts. You have the local court, state court, and I'm um, sorry. Yeah, I just saw the chat. That's why I got a little bit distracted. I'm sorry. But you have the local court, state court, and federal courts. Um, local courts lie within a, a particular area and deal with not as serious offenses. State courts are above local courts and they, they're basically, they deal with much, excuse me, they deal with much more serious crimes such as murder, um, robbery and anything of that sort. But then you have the federal courts and you also have the Supreme Court of the United States, which is the highest court above all, but they deal with national interests but there's also federal courts that deal with bribery, mail fraud, and crimes that occur in more than one state. And then 
Um, and then you have Mr. Amster. So Mr. Amster will talk more about himself. I just wanted to point out a really interesting case where Mr. Amster was the leading attorney for. I'm not sure if you've heard of it or if you haven't, but there was the Grim Sleeper case. And basically what happened in this case, it was an individual who murdered 10 people throughout, uh, throughout Los Angeles and was convicted of sexual assault as well. Um, he was given the death penalty and about a week or two ago, he actually passed away. Not, not due to the death penalty, but he, he passed away. So that's that. And um, I will pass the baton over to Mr. Rapster now. Okay, thank, thank you, Rosie. Mm -hmm. So what I would like to start with is um, the chart that we have, um, giving a roadmap of how you should, how you can become a lawyer. So the first aspect of our roadmap is starting in high school and college. There are things that you can do while you're in high school to prepare yourself for being an attorney. Um, certainly one of them, um, which I would assume a lot of you are familiar with, is the teen court program. Through the teen court program, you will get the basic feel of what a courtroom is like. You will have, um, you'll interact with the judiciary, with judges. You'll, um, um, you'll start getting the beginning understanding of questioning. But most important on being a criminal defense attorney is acting as a juror. Many criminal defense attorneys or many attorneys never get the experience of actually being in a jury room and understanding the dynamics of how a jury interacts with each other and how they come to a decision. So imagine if you're an attorney, you are going to do a jury trial, you've never sat on jury service because Every time you were um, on a panel or going to be on a panel, either you were removed because you were an attorney or you didn't have the time to volunteer. And so now you're going to do your first jury trial and you have this whole mystery, what happens in the jury room. And then let's say you're being opposed by someone who went through teen court, who understands the dynamics of a jury. You're now starting to see that the individual who's gone through teen court now has an advantage over the attorney who never had that experience. Because putting 12 people together in a jury room is different than just putting 12 people um, together in a different setting. And one of the most important things that you learn as a teen court juror is the use of jury instructions. And with the use of jury instructions, as an attorney, knowing that the jury instructions are a roadmap for a jury allows the attorney to realize why they have to emphasize the jury instructions in their closing argument. Um, so being part of teen court prepares you with practical experience on how to be a better attorney. On top of that, to prepare for college and law school, volunteering, um, for activities that are law related is extremely important because you want to build out your um, resume or the things that you can submit with your um, college application. So any committees you can be part of, maybe through teen court or through um, your school uh, is very important. Letters of recommendation is another thing that's very important. So being involved in professionals um, in the community is important. Um, so being involved with the judiciary with teen court, being um, going to volunteering at a nonprofit like a food bank or something can be important. Even volunteering for a political campaign is extremely important. Why? Because you will meet people in that political campaign that are really important people in the community. If you do phone banking, you might be sitting next to someone who is an elected official or who is an attorney or is a well-known doctor. And then the two of you are participating in a cause you both believe in. And next thing you know, you have a conversation. And the next thing you know, 
you now have somebody who might give you contacts that will help you going to college. You might be an alumni from that university or somebody that will give you a letter of recommendation. So the more you do things in high school to get yourself out in the community where you can meet people, the better you have a chance of moving forward. Now, when you go, you're gonna to go to college. Now, there are many routes of going to college from high school. There is nothing wrong with going to community college first and then going on to a, um, complete your degree at a four-year college and then moving on to go to law school. Now, I do wanna point out that there is a program for those who um, don't have all the financial resources of going just to a community college and then going to law school and becoming an, an attorney. So there's a program called Pathways to Law School that allows two ways for individuals to become attorneys. One is you go to a community college. Um, the best one is, let's talk about Mission College in the San Fernando Valley. If you go to San Fernando High School, you can take college courses from for Mission High School, for, I'm sorry, Mission Community College on your high school campus, transfer those credits to Mission um, Community College if you enroll there, not pay any money for two years, graduate from Mission Community College, and then if you cho so choose, you can go to a state bar certified law school like University of West Los Angeles, which is in Chatsworth or Inglewood, as well as Glendale um, Law School, and there are a few others. These are, not, the, these are not ABA accredited law schools, but they're state bar accredited law schools. You can then go to law school, you can complete, and within five years of leaving high school, you can become an attorney. Now, will you be able to as easily get a job at a big Fortune 500 law firm? No. But will you be able to earn a living as an attorney? Absolutely. And sometimes that's a better route to go than if you don't feel you've got the financial resources of going the traditional route for seven years. What's important is to know your options and never feel that there's such a hurdle in front of you that you cannot um, accomplish your goal. So that's what is critical to know, keep moving forward. So also through the pathways of law schools, and these were the community college, you can go two years to a community college, transfer to a four-year college like CSUN, and then these schools are then in partnership with law schools. So you can basically shave off one year of the traditional seven-year process by doing the pathways to law school and going on through in such a way. So these are the options you have in front of you. Now, in college, what major should you take? This is a really, really tricky question, okay? I took history because I knew I can get a very high GPA, all right? So call me lazy, call me whatever, that's what I did. And I did do well in college. If I had lived it again, I would have challenged myself and I would have instead have taken accounting classes and have ended up as an accountant when I completed college. Why? Because initially I wanted to be a tax attorney. Things happened in my life that I did not pursue that. But having a college degree of being an accountant then going through law school and then being a lawyer put, would have put myself in a position to become an accountant for the wealthy because an accountant for the wealthy is a tax attorney. And so therefore, sometimes you wanna look at what undergraduate degree you wanna take and will this enhance yourself in being a lawyer. Now, with that being said, I originally felt that philosophy was a great major for law school, for um, college, because the bar exam, uh, or the LSAT, excuse me, is a logic game. And philosophy teach you, teaches you logic. So that was what um, my 
feeling was. My daughter um, was a philosophy major, but she said to me, no, dad, it's better for individuals to be math majors if they can, because a lot of what you do is math. And so therefore, um, that was what her suggestion is. The bottom line is um, that I don't think there's a wrong route to take in the undergraduate degree. I think what's most important is to balance education with GPA. These are the years of your life and you should do so. Now, while you're in college, remain active also. You still need to build up your resume so that when you apply for law school, you are different than the others. Um, yes, through our program, we allow you to stay involved in teen court. Again, you should be involved in political campaigns and you should be doing things for your community and being leaders too, writing things, creating a program. Um, an example, we have a young man who interned with us while he was in college. He created a college club on his campus. Um, actually, it's Pesa LMU. He utilized that and that puts him in a position to separate himself from the rest when applying for law school. And that's what you're looking for. How can you separate yourself from the rest? How can you show that you are better than everyone um, else applying or how you're unique, I think is a better term. So that's my advice on college. And of course, any questions you might have, you know, please put it on the chat line so that I can respond to them. The LSAT. So um, I feel I'm in a unique position to talk about two roots concerning the LSAT. So both my children are endeavoring in a field of law. My son um, is an attorney and my daughter is in her second year of law school. Both of them took different routes for the LSAT. So Michael, my son, was not looking to get in one of the most elite um, law schools. It was not necessary for him. He was looking for a law school that was designed to give him an education for government service. So therefore, he was not looking to get into the 90 percentile on the LSAT. He was just looking to get a decent score. So he took a group LSAT program, and I think they're all about the same. I really think that you should talk to your college counselors or talk to fellow um, or go and find law school students or friends you know as to which is the um, best group um, LSAT um, program. And if you want a recommendation in the future, um, email me and I'll let you know what my son utilized. But I don't think one is better than the other or that I have the information to advise which is best for this. And he had got a respectable score on his LSAT. Now he was faced with two choices. He could have gone to Loyola Law School actually on a full ride, or he could have gone to Hastings on a 50% ride. He chose UC Hastings um, with the consent of his parents because that was a school that was specifically designed to um, go into government service. If he was gonna follow my footsteps and be a criminal defense attorney, I would have recommended Loyola. Loyola is an excellent school if you're gonna be a litigator, if you're gonna be a trial attorney. They're very strong in that. And I hope that's also giving you a little bit of a hint. It's not the worst idea to investigate the law schools to see if that matches what you want to do, what field of law you want to be in. If you don't know, it doesn't make a difference. But if you do have a desire, it's important to do that. Now, the other route, my daughter, Haley, um, who is clearly a mutation because she's so much smarter than me, it's not even close. Um, and, um, and clearly she's got a lot of her brains from her mom but her mom will admit that she's smarter than her too. So she's a mutation. Um, so Haley was absolutely, she was going to either go to one of the top five law schools or die. That's a direct quote. And um, so she wanted to get in the 90 percentile on the LSAT. 
the 90 percentile is extremely hard. The, the slightest error, you're out of the 90 percentile. The wrong question that you didn't quite study for, one question could throw you off. It, it, it's, it's an extremely difficult process. Yes, she got in the 90 percentile, and she did not do a group LSAT. She had a one-on-one -on -one LSAT coach who she found through a program that was designed for that. So at first it was online, and then she wasn't scoring in the 90 percentile. She was like just underneath it, and she got frustrated, and so it was decided to get her a one-on-one -on -one tutor that was available, and it made the difference. And so for her, that worked. And it allowed her to get accepted to five law schools. Now, uh, all top five. She was waitlisted on one. Now, she too had an interesting decision because she wanted to go into a field of intellectual property of basically uh, representing companies that are dealing with um, breaches of um, the internet, of their um, protected stuff. Um, okay, so, um, all right, so we just had a, an interesting question that I, I am gonna jump in on right now. Um, the question is, can you take the LSAT more than once? Yes, you can. You can take it multiple times and only use your highest score. Um, this is, and many individuals do that. So this goes into the question, should you take a gap year or not? And this is a tough question for many individuals. So straight up, um, um, the mother of my children and me were opposed to Michael ever considering taking a gap year because we were concerned that he would go back, okay? With Haley, she considered a gap year. We never were concerned about it. It was her call because Haley's a very highly energetic individual. There are advantages of taking a gap year. And you know, I'm gonna come back to that in a second on the gap year. But yes, you can take the LSAT more than once. The trick is make sure that you have enough time to take the LSAT more than once for when you want to apply to law school, okay? That's the, the situation. Figure out your timeline, figure out how much time you want, um, and then um, figure it out from there. And you can take it three times within a single testing year, but again, I mean, you can take it multiple times. The thing is this, risk benefit. Is your score really going to get higher? What have you done to change your um, ability to get a higher score? Don't frustrate yourself. It's not the end of the world. Um, so a question's now being asked, what is the difference between the LSAT and the GRE? The GRE, I believe, is for other programs. Um, if I remember correctly, I think for, t um, for accounting or tax or business. Um, and the LSAT is for lawyers. And there might be other ones. So if you want to go to law school, you got to take an LSAT. If you want to go to um, you know, a business school or something, I think you need to do the GRE. Uh, okay, I'm being told GMAT is for business, GRE is general master's programs. So if you're going to go to law school, a GRE is not going to work. Now, if you're going to get a combined degree of some sort that includes a master's and a law degree, then a um, GRE might work. So the real bottom line is, I'm not going to say that I completely know that. Talk to your college counselor. What is a wise person? A wise person is not somebody who knows everything, but knows where to get the information that you need. So be wise. Um, so, so talking about, uh, okay, so two things. So using my daughter as an example. 
My daughter was admitted to the University of Chicago with a full ride. She was admitted to Stanford with very little of a um, scholarship. She wanted to do intellectual property. So the question was, and University of Chicago is an excellent school, but they did not have a program designed for intellectual property. So it would not have given her the best education. Stanford, on the other hand, has a program designed for intellectual property. Actually, Harvard and Stanford are the best. And in the end, she decided to go to Stanford, and I'll say why in a second. But when she got accepted to Stanford and everything else, she was able to get financial assistance to assist her. Now, the tricky, so this is also another tricky thing on your gap year too. So I wanna go into gap year now. I don't quite know exactly what the age is. I think it's 25 or 26. If you apply for graduate school at 25 or 26, your income is utilized for financial aid and not your custodial parent, okay? Yeah, guess what? You're over 18, you think you're done with your parent, but for law school finances, the house you live in is your custodial parent, all right? So not quite done with the uh, apron strings yet. All right, so if you're under 26, I believe, and you apply, your custodial parent's income is utilized to determine what financial assistance you're gonna get. But if you're over, only your income, and your income's most likely substantially less than your custodial parent, and then you get more. So it's your custodial parent as well as your other parent too, but not as much. It's primarily custodial parent that's utilized, other parent, what can they contribute? So Haley came down to the decision between Harvard and Stanford on intellectual property. When she went to look at Harvard, all of the incoming students were older than her. So Harvard was basically a school where students not only took a gap year, many times they took more than one year to get going in a practice, again, going in a profession, maybe save up enough money to concentrate on law school. So she kind of felt out of place at Harvard. Um, a lot of the kids were looking down on her um, or the fellow students. When she went to Stanford, it was entirely different. At Stanford, there were um, students, you know, her age, she felt more comfortable. Um, so that's where she decided to go in. Now, just a little bit of a side note is when she went into law school, it's divided into sections, and her sections had 10 individuals that did not completely agree with her politically. And so law school's brutal. If you think that middle school was tough, um, high school, college, um, law school is, and I will, I think I can unabashedly say this, you're going to be dealing with white male privilege big time in law school. And they know it and they're arrogant on it. So with Haley in her section, she identified 10 individuals that she had names for that were public enemies um, that would try to put her down. And unfortunately, that's the beginning of the law profession. There are bullies in it. There are people who put you down. You've got to have the self-esteem and the strength to keep moving forward and know who you are. And if you ever have a question mark on that, which I did when I first started practicing, I would say to myself, hey, I've got a client who's counting on me and I don't have the time to wallow in self-esteem issues or anything else. I need to do what's necessary. I need to go straight up against somebody who's got 10 or 15 years experience over me and think they're arrogant. So, Fear is very common throughout the entire practice, college, law school, being a lawyer, you're gonna deal with fear. That's not the question. There's nothing wrong with fear. It's how you deal with fear. 
And how I like to think about it is just think if you were in World War II, especially either on D-Day or in one of the landings of the Pacifics, that you got on that beach with all the bullets coming at you. You don't think they were afraid? They were very afraid. But it's those who can control their fear and keep moving forward are the heroes in our community. And that's true right now of what we're going through. And that's true of being a lawyer. You must control your fear. There is nothing wrong with either going into the bathroom or going into a lonely hill and letting it out when nobody's around, okay? I have, I know where all the mountaintops are, where I live, how to get there, and how to scream my lungs out that nobody hears. So, and it's kind of beneficial, it's kind of fun too, all right? So have your way of getting it out. Know who you are, there's nothing wrong with fear. And you're gonna have fear in the LSAT as well. Control your fear. Know what you need to do, move forward. Um, Haley also did something else that was very interesting with her LSAT. She went to the place that she was going to take the exam beforehand. She went into the room. She kind of figured out where she was going to sit. She looked at the clock. She got herself acclimated to the environment. And that is a great tool for you to remember throughout life. The more you can prepare for something, the more you can get information, the more that you know what's coming and aren't going to be surprised of what's coming is how you can address fear and how you control it. It is the unknown that scares us the most. So therefore, prepare yourself. And that's the key. So kind of going back to the question, can you take the LSAT three times or two times? Um, yes, but more importantly, make sure that you're prepared properly to take it the first time. Don't rush it through. Figure out, do I need a gap year so I can prepare more? What do I need to do to make sure that this unknown I can handle it? How many practice tests can I get? How could I feel closely about it? Okay. All right. So, um, so that's the LSAT law school. The most important class to get underneath your belt in law school. Okay. Evidence. Evidence is huge. Why? Go to school for a year and a half, have evidence completed, you can practice law underneath the supervision of an attorney. So everybody is, everybody is going to try to get that evidence class out of the way. So know that, try to get it out of the way so you can move forward and be able then to go into a law firm and actually appear in court. Um, if you're supervised by a lawyer and you've taken evidence, you can apply to the state bar. It's a simple procedure done all the time to now be a practicing attorney in all ways underneath the supervision of a lawyer. Okay. So you want to take evidence. Now th there are other classes you have to take, but then there are the electives and the electives are important to take one. If you know what field of law you're going into, Try to take electives that assist you in that field, that will give you the information. And two, also use the electives to experience a field of law that you're not sure you want, but you might enjoy, so you wanna do it, okay? Now, one of the things that I consistently and constantly tell my children, but they do not believe me, but realize that I'm right, the law is constantly changing. So the law that you are taught in law school is not necessarily the law you're gonna be using as an attorney, okay? So what is the most important thing to learn in law school? Methodology. How are you gonna find what the law is? How are you gonna help your client? So one of the things I did that I advised both my children and they rejected it, 
but found their own way, was I was not going to ask a question of the professor to explain a case or what the law was better for me in class. I would go up to the li law library after every class and I would research it and learn it that way. I forced myself to learn on my own what the law was under the parameters and the umbrella of what the professor was doing. I believe that there is a logic to the law. Again, my son accepted that concept earlier. My daughter just admitted it. The law is practical. There is a reason for each law. If you can grasp the logic, you know what the case law is before you find the cases. And I think that helped, I, helped me grasp that very early by doing the research. Because now, if you're around me, when there's a concept or something, what I think, I will very boldly say, this is what I believe the law is, and I'm, now I'm going to go find the cases that back up my position. Instead of going to the cases first and um, finding my position. This concept was most critical for me in a published decision um, that I was on out of the Ninth Circuit, where a appellate, a Ninth Circuit, which is a federal appellate court, found that the right to cross-examination trumps the attorney-client privilege. And it, it, it was like a groundbreaking case. And it was a, a situation where information was given by a co-defendant to an attorney, and it was known by the defendant's attorney, and the defendant's attorney asked for it, and the judge denied it because of the attorney-client privilege. And the Ninth Circuit said, nope. That's wrong. He had a right to it because the at attorney client privilege is only a statutory right. And the right to cross examination or obtain evidence is a constitutional right. I'm just going to go into that a little bit more. The Constitution, no law can violate the Constitution. That is the umbrella that governs every statute enacted by Congress and every statute enacted by a state legislature. And so the legislatures, federal and state, cannot enact a law that is violative of the Constitution. So therefore, if you can base your argument on the Constitution, more specifically, usually the Bill of Rights, and you can show that a statute is violating the Bill of Rights, you will win the day. So the trump card is always the Constitution. Okay, what else in law school? Um, make your connections. Um, learn methodology. That is what is important. Now, the bar exam. It is really, really an injustice to law school students that they have to take a prep course after graduating law school to pass the bar exam. Um, I would love to see us do a social movement at some point. What is the point of going to three or four years of law school? If you now got to take a prep course to pass the bar exam, why weren't you taught in law school all of the things you needed to pass that bar exam? Uh, and in, I don't know of anyone who's ever been able to pass that bar exam without taking some type of prep course. And I really think that's a tremendous injustice. Um, so the question is, what does the bar exam consist of? The bar exam consists of, um, so, okay, in my day, and I hate doing that because it's ancient, it was a three-day exam. I don't believe it's a three-day exam anymore. It's a two-day exam, okay? And it consists of essay questions and multiple choice questions. 
And the questions are based on the multi-state laws, not on the individual laws of the state, except for one state, okay? And the one state is a state that the state laws are based on Napoleonic Code, and that state is Louisiana. Louisiana has a different heritage than the rest of the United States, because Louisiana only came in to the United States as a result of the Louisiana Purchase after the Constitution was created, and they were under Napoleonic law first. And therefore, the basis of their system, as it does not violate the Constitution, is Napoleonic law. The difference between Napoleonic law and the way we handle our judicial system is Napoleonic law is based upon writing. Your judges act as your investigators, where our, um, where we basically um, are um, one that relies upon cross-examination. So <laughs> the question is, has my history degree um, come in handy? And I need to go back. I didn't finish the bar exam. I apologize about that. Well, it sure as heck is entertaining. Um, it um, allows um, my daughter to continuously tease me that the only TV channel I want to watch is all Hitler all the time, which I don't agree with. Um, yes, history has been of value. I have quoted um, presidents, our history factors in my trials. I actually won a civil trial because I knew the story of George Washington before the Constitutional Convention of where the Articles of Confederation were a mess. And he made the decision that he was gonna step forward to save the country and be the primary proponent in the Constitutional Convention. And the way I utilize this is I started off my closing argument talking about George Washington sitting um, at um, Arlington, looking over the Potomac, realizing there was a mess, and never mentioning who he was. And why did I do that? So that I could get the jury to be intrigued. Being a lawyer is being an actor or an actress. It is dramatic. If your audience isn't listening to you, then you might as well be speaking in a field with nobody around you. You got to get them interested in you. And that's why many times those who know me, I will say, always watch your audience. Always see if they're properly interacting with you. This is one time where I'm having a problem seeing my whole audience. Okay, so, um, but yes, history helped me that way. Um, I think knowledge in and of itself is always important. Anything you can throw on in that's different, to spark the curiosity, to utilize things, I think is important. The bar exam is basically gonna consist of a lot of a lot of uh, multiple choice questions that will be based upon the multi-state. And, and so a lot of that you're gonna get from your bar um, prep course. They will teach you what's basically in common with all the multi-states. You will learn what the UCC is, the Uniform Commercial Code, which is basically a code that is based upon from, state, from all the states for businesses on how they can protect their assets, how, who gets what, when it happens. Um, it's, it's really important. One of the boringest classes you'll ever take in law school, but it's very important. Um, there's the evidence code. There are basic things in the evidence code. Basically, federal um, rules of evidence, federal rules of civil procedure will be on the bar exam because that's all across the country. So it's gonna be the broad stuff on federal. Um, what's common? among the 50 states, which is the federal, because we all have federal courts, 
and which will also be um, the Uniform Commercial Code. You will then have essays. It is <coughs> not always important to know the specific answer to the essays. What's important is for you to issue spot. You've got to be able to spot what the issues are. And going into law school, I would suggest you will be taking a writing course that's offered, I believe, in the first year, although I think it might be later now, which I always felt it should be. But take the time to either sit down with a third year law school student or a professor and ask them about issue spotting to explain it to you. It's tricky. It is to identify what issues are in an essay question that you need to address. Because many times you're not graded upon the answer that you gave to the issue, but if you, I, if you identified that the issue existed. Law is such that there are two sides of every issue. So what's important is the methodology, that you identified the issue, that you stated your position, and why you believe in your position. That's what's important. Another thing on test taking, which I'm sure all of you know, but I had forgotten. So I'm a certified criminal law specialist. And when I, um, so I was certified criminal law specialist. I took the criminal law specialist exam. I forgot the basic rules. Basic rule, read the instructions. Do not rely upon the oral instructions the proctor gives. I did that. And as such, the written instructions were different. And I thought that I didn't have to explain in detail my answers um, because he didn't say that, but I had to. So I would have flunked myself on the criminal law specialist exam, but I passed it anyway. So I really have a question on their methodology, but I decided never to bring it up to them and tell them I really should be taking this a second time. I just took my specialist degree and moved forward. Um, so a question is, um, would I recommend a degree in English to help get through law school? Absolutely, okay? I am not good in English. I am not good in grammar. I had any number of teachers bring that to my attention in high school. I now have two children who love to bring it to my attention at any given point. So I give them the briefs to go through when they bring it up. Um, law is writing. If you can write well, you're always going to have a job. You, um, you're going to be needed to write briefs for trial court, for motions, to be an appellate attorney. Writing is extremely important. So yes, I strongly recommend English. Um, very important. Um, and um, question is, do you have to specialize in law school and when do you have to decide by? No, you do not have to specialize in law school. Most attorneys, when they get into the field of law, don't know what field they wanna go into. And they usually um, start practicing if they go on their own rent law. And what is rent law? It's anybody who will come on in to pay the rent. So um, it's as general as you get. All right, so, um, so the main thing with the bar exam, be prepared, take your time. I believe that the bar exam is offered too quickly after one graduates from law school. I recommended to my son that upon his graduation that he did not do anything except study for the bar exam, which he did, and he passed the first time. Um, so um, that it's important to have enough time to study for that exam. There is nothing wrong with not passing the first time. I've known many fine attorneys, some better than me, that it took multiple times for them to pass. There's one story of an individual who I think took it about 15 times um, he became a judge. <laughs> so I guess if you have to take it more than one time, it won't stop you from moving forward and becoming a judge. 
I'm going to leave that one at that and not go any further because it's being recorded and who knows what might happen to me with my statements. Okay, you're now a lawyer. Big question on being a lawyer. Um, do you or do you not go on your own? Okay, I made the foolish mistake of immediately going out of law school on going into private practice by myself. Okay. Um, I'm an independent type of guy. It was a mistake. And as many of my friends said to me later on, you want to go into a law firm because when you mess up, let it be on their malpractice insurance and not yours because you are going to mess up. It's just going to happen. So I strongly recommend, even if you want to be a sole practitioner, to go into a um, either a government um, job or a private law firm to get your feet wet. Now, um, the trick in becoming, so in criminal law, and I'm gonna kind of now focus this more on criminal law. And I'm gonna lead this into the Grim Sleeper case actually. So, in the Constitution, you have the Sixth Amendment. Um, I'm, I'm going to ad address a question submitted by Sarah. Does law school GPA and class standing matter? If you want to get into a big firm, probably does. Okay, so I had this great law school GPA going into my final semester of my third year. And what happened was, uh, unfortunately, my the family business went bankrupt, and I was dealing with emotions. And so one class, I just barely passed, which I did, and I didn't make the dean's list. Um, so I graduated in the top third of my class, but not as high as I was. Hasn't made a difference to me. Um, now, if you're going to go to a top firm, if you want to be a a clerk for a US Supreme Court, yeah, class ranking makes a difference. But at the end of the day, class ranking or GPA has nothing to do with you're gonna be, how good of a lawyer you're going to be. I happen to feel that the trial attorneys usually don't come from the best law schools because to be a really good trial attorney, you gotta to communicate to the common people. And a lot of the individuals who've gone through law school don't have the ability to communicate to the common people. Communication is your key, okay? So I always recommend strive for the best to be at the top, but don't stress yourself out if you're not. And if you don't, don't say that's it, my life is over. That's ridiculous. Always remember this, General Ulysses S. Grant graduated near the bottom of his class. At the top of that class was Robert E. Lee, who was the one who won the Civil War. Ulysses S. Grant, not Robert E. Lee, okay? So, um, and who became president of the United States. So I certainly don't think that Ulysses S. Grant's life was ruined because he didn't make it into the um, top elite of his graduating class. And then we can go on and on and on. Keep moving forward, that's what's important. So the question is, what are the pros and cons of going into a firm? Okay. Do you wanna be your own boss or not? So in a firm, you don't have to worry about um, cases or getting clients. The firm has the clients. There are multiple, there, there are usually the larger the firm, there are multiple practices you can be involved in. But there are politics in firms and, um, and you don't have your freedom of what you wanna argue on a case. I was in a firm for a short period of time, a couple of years. Um, and actually what caused me to become a criminal attorney. Um, let's just say that the boss and I had a lot of long conversations where I diplomatically told him he had no idea what he was talking about, okay? Um, and, um, I would do it his way when that was the order, but then he'd realize we need to do it my way. 
I, 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 okay, anybody who knows me knows I have a hard time um, giving up my independence. You give up your independence in a firm. I like creativity, taking risks, and going for it. That's not necessarily will always be allowed in a firm setting. Two, white male privilege is huge in a firm. So if you're white male, it's good. If you're not, you're going to be fighting it and you're going to have to take the hit. What are you going to do when you're in a conference with the partners and the partners look at the women in the, in the room and say, you guys all have to leave now. We're going to tell some dirty jokes. And that has happened. And I think it is disgusting. I don't think for any second that I am advocating it's right. I'm just here to let you know what's going on. On the other hand, I strongly recommend those who are not white males to get into the firm to break this terrible um, situation that we have. But if you're going to do it, keep your eyes open and find your friends. Find the people you can rally around. It is always good to be a trailblazer, but be wise as a trailblazer to move forward. So um, we're getting close on time and I want to accomplish everything. Um, as a criminal defense attorney, you have the option of either working for the government or working on your own. So there are three ways. There's a public defender and an alternate public defender. And what I was getting to is the Sixth Amendment creates right to counsel, therefore meaning that if you cannot afford an attorney, you have to be appointed an attorney, and the taxpayers' dollars go for criminal defense attorneys who are, on, who are being appointed. So to save money, you have the public defenders and the alternate public defender. Defendant gets arrested, doesn't have money for an attorney. The first attorney they will look at is the public defender. The public defender, now let's say three people commit a crime together. Well, you can't have the public defender representing all three people because they could have a conflict. What is the potential conflict? He did it. So you can't represent two clients where they're both pointing the fingers at each other. So that's the conflict. So therefore, only one attorney can represent one client on a multiple defendant case. So in Los Angeles, the first defendant goes to the public defender. The second defendant goes to the alternate public defender. The third defendant goes to a list of approved appointed attorneys that are underneath the contract. So there's the ICDA, the um, IDC, Indigent Defense Council um, Association, I guess it is. And um, the ICDA, something like that. I, I forget the, what the initials stand for. I'm sorry, I should know. The ICDA is you apply for that panel, you get on that panel, you then get the, um, then the court contacts the ICDA panel to um, assign a case to an attorney for the attorney then to handle it. Why is it done that way and not by a judge assigning the individual attorney to get out of politics? and favors. At one time, it was the individual judges appointing the attorneys, and they would appoint the attorneys who they like best, or maybe not give as hard of a time or fight as hard for the clientele. Um, and one thing that's not known, that is an interesting piece of trivia, the major proponent and creator of this court appointed panel I'm talking about, ICDA, was Judge Wesley. David Wesley, before he was a judge, was the big proponent of this and created it for us. That's how I first got to know Dave. Um, so you get, so the, so the third defendant is one of these appointed attorneys. Now, there are grades, one through five, okay? Five being the highest of being death penalty cases, one being the lowest as a misdemeanor case. You get on a rotation to get your death penalty case. In a death penalty case, there are two attorneys appointed. One attorney to be the lead attorney, the second attorney to assist supposedly only in 
the penalty phase. When they, so for a death penalty case, you've got two phases. One is guilt, one is penalty. I was brought in on the Grim Sleeper case as the second attorney because the lead attorney was a private attorney. And then when I came in, I had a meeting with the judges at their request and they wanted me to become the lead attorney. So I became the lead attorney on the case. So I got on the case through appointment. I made sure that I worked myself up the chain to have sufficient um, trials to be able to qualify to be what's called a grade five attorney. Um, so can the judge decide who the lead attorney is? No. Well, yes and no. Normally, if both attorneys are appointed attorneys, the panel decides who the lead attorney is. There's a attorney in charge of the panel by the name of Zeke Perlow, who has been an attorney forever. And he basically, the buck stops at his desk. And so he can make the call. But again, we're taking the judges out of the um, decision making. The judge decide, the judges do decide who is eligible to accept the death penalty case from the list of attorneys on the panel. Um, and every year they review us, they determine if we're still eligible, um, or if they think, no, you're not good, or if somebody else applies, they should be eligible. So when, a, when you have both attorneys appointed, the panel is going to decide who the lead one is. When you have a private attorney, the judges might influence the situation to cause the more qualified attorney to be the lead attorney. And that's what happened in the Grim Sleeper case. I was persuaded to go to the lead attorney, tell her to become the secondary attorney, and I should become the lead attorney, which is what happened. Um, and then we went from there. Um, the Grim Sleeper case, from day one, the prosecution believed he was responsible for 18 murders. You can only sit on a death penalty case if you believe in the death penalty. If you don't believe in the death penalty, if you believe that the state should never utilize it, you are ineligible to sit on a death penalty case. So therefore, a jury on a death penalty case is constituted of individuals who believe in certain situations the death penalty could occur. So <laughs> it was our strategy that if a juror believed that somebody was responsible for 18 murders and they believe the death penalty, if you're not going to give this individual the death penalty, if you believe in it and they're good for 18 murders, then who are you going to give it to? So therefore, it was our strategy from the very beginning on this case to raise every issue that we could, because we looked at every issue that we could, bought him six more months of life, because the appellate process is very long, and we created a lingering doubt defense. And a lingering doubt defense is somebody to be found guilty of a crime must be found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. There can't be reasonable doubt. But when you get to the penalty phase, an additional concept is in there that if you got a lingering doubt, if you go, you know, it might be they didn't do it, that can be used as a reason not to vote for the death penalty. So our belief was to um, go for a lingering doubt. So the question is, how do I feel safe working so closely with killers? Is there some type of protection? One, um, well, I could say that I never felt any concern about the Grim Sleeper. But my previous case, um, well, one of my previous death penalty cases was of a defendant who had stabbed his previous attorney in court. And nobody else on the panel would take the case. I chose to. I was asked if I would because, all right. Case comes down on the day that I'm doing my duty day. That's a day when a bar panel attorney, the appointment list, 
you're now going to cover the entire courthouse to determine how cases should be handled. So, um, and I can mention today, the, 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 the client's name was Vicente Fournier. So Vicente, three days before, uh, so Vicente had confessed to a crime because he wanted the death penalty because he was on Pelican Bay and he was a germaphobic and he wanted to get out of Pelican Bay and realized if he was put on death row, he would get great accommodations and probably live longer than he would be executed. So he confessed, he sent a letter to the police confessing to an old robbery murder. And the letter comes down, law enforcement puts it together, they go and they arrest him, he gets a public defender appointed, uh, really nice guy, really nice guy. Um, uh, we laugh about the case now. And, the, and so in Division 30, there's a way that you can talk to your client, but you've got to lean over beyond the rail. So Vicente asked John to come over. John came over. John leaned her over the rail, and Vicente took a razor blade and cut him. And the whole court goes bonkers, and the case is postponed for three days. Three days later, I come walking in at a quarter of four. The case comes down. Now, still the death penalty case, but there's now a new charge, the attempted murder of the public defender. Most critical thing of an attorney, think fast, be strong, and know when you're right. It's a quarter of four. This case comes down in the same courtroom where the stabbing occurred. I immediately grab the file. I walk up to the clerk, the judicial assistant. I say, we need to transfer this case to Department 100 like now. It's a quarter of four. And the judge leans over to me, and I'm not going to say who the judge was, and says, why? I go, your honor, with all due respect, you're a witness. Everybody in this courtroom's a witness. You can't have an arraignment with all these witnesses. You can't do the arraignment. It's a quarter of four. We don't get it up to Department 100. Court's going to be done for the day, and we're going to have a mess. And he says, well, all I did is I saw it. I ordered everybody out of the courtroom. And I go, how does that not make you a witness? And he goes, well, I'm not so sure I'm going to be called to testify. I go, your honor, there's a death penalty case associated with this. Do you really want to create an issue this early in a case where all we have to do is pick up the phone, transfer the file to Department 100, take care of it from there, and there's no issue. You just need to move a body upstairs. He goes, all right, all right. So he gets on the phone, calls, I go upstairs, I go in front of a judge, Judge Van Sicklin, um, who I have tremendous amount of respect for, and Judge Van Sicklin looks at the file and says, why did it take so long for this case to be transferred up here? I go, you know, Your Honor, I cannot, I'm not going to answer that question. You're in charge of the building. You can make the inquiry. <laughs> Let's just take care of things. All right. So that's my little story on that. Then, of course, what happens is I, Vicente and I have a conversation. He reminds me that he wants the death penalty. He asks me if I'm going to argue against the death penalty. I tell him yes. He says, you know what I did to the last attorney? And I go, you know what, Vicente? You got to do what you got to do, and I got to do what I got to do. And so... Um, it probably was good that I was going through a divorce at this period of time, because if I had come home and told that story to my wife, I'm not so sure that she would have been as thrilled as I was in keeping the case. Um, and I just said to the judge, we're going to have certain rules on this case. I am never going to be leaning towards my client um, and allow him to um, stab me. Okay, so we did that. Some point, he brings in a shank that somehow had my name on it. Everybody goes bonkers. My co-counsel, Vincent Oliver, great guy, he was able to talk Vicente and he taking just a life without the possibility of parole and happened and that's how it ended up the case and I didn't get stabbed and no, um, I'm not afraid of him. Why? Never show your fear to someone. You show your fear, you're done, okay? Um, and so, no, I'm not afraid of my clients, but, I don't take unreasonable risks. Uh, how do you proceed with if you disagree with what your client wants? Um, interesting roadmap. Your client, okay, the attorney makes all the strategic decisions. 
the only decision the client unilaterally has to control is his testimony. So you get, if the client wants to testify, go ahead and testify. Say what you want to say. You ask very open questions. You let them talk. Okay. Then you argue how you want. Um, are they always happy with you? No, but you're the attorney and they're not. So I recently had a case where my client decided, did not understand what the concept of a restraining order was. And he kept coming around his girlfriend, even though she made it absolutely clear she didn't want to be around him anymore. And so he decided the best thing to do was to hang out at the gym she goes to, um, put a mask on, and grab her and force her into her car at gunpoint so he could have a discussion with her and tell her how she was wrong. He decided to do this in front of an off-duty FBI agent who retrieves a gun, uh, his gun, and so there's a gunfight and it's a big race, everything else. All right, end of story. The client wanted me to handle the case one way. I said, no, I'm handling it this way, okay? End of story. The client did get convicted of kidnapping, but not of attempted murder of the FBI agent or his girlfriend and everything else. So he's eligible for parole in eight years where he was looking at multiple life sentences because I knew what the right way was to try the case. And I'm gonna do it no matter what my client says, as long as I'm within the ethical limits, okay? Don't worry, I don't think I did a bad thing for society because he's not from this country, so there's an immigration hold. So once he gets eligible for life, he'll be going back to another country and make a deal with his emotional behaviors. Um, bottom line, okay, enjoy what you do. I really enjoy being a criminal defense attorney. I love the challenge of everyone against me, that I'm the underdog. It just it thrills me, okay? Uh, I've often said that I really should go see a psychiatrist, but I'm scared of what's gonna happen if I do. Um, and I mean, if anybody is really studying my life, you'll see that consistently, that's what I keep doing. It's a challenge, represent the underdog, have the fight, do what's necessary. I believe it keeps me young. I, I wake up in the morning, I enjoy what I'm doing. I, I, I see other attorneys at my age and they're like, oh, same old, same old because they're not enjoying what they're doing. So my advice to all of you is, find what you like, have your passion. Don't let your passion completely get in control of you. But when you do, know how to say I'm sorry and to back down. There's been at least three times in my career where the judge has said, one more word from you and you're going into jail with your client. Your client usually will say, just say this, just say this, just say this. You look at your client and you say, I hear you, but I need to live another day so I can argue for you on another occasion. And I'm not going to pull the tiger's tail at this moment. It's not going to work. On the other hand, I have been highly passionate in the courtroom and been respected because of it. And it really cracks me up. I mean, I once was really, really passionate um, on a restraining order issue at two o'clock in the afternoon in a courtroom in front of a judge. 6.30 that night, I'm at a bar event and the judge is there and he's walking over to me saying hello to, to me and how are you? I go, your honor. Why are you being so nice to me? I wasn't so nice to you a couple hours ago. I go, I'm sorry, because no, 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 don't apologize. You are being passionate. You are fighting for your client. And that's the thing. So even when I'm passionate, I will always say your honor. I will always use respectful language. I will just might say it a little bit more passionate than I should. But as long as there's not tape recordings in the courtroom, I can get away with it because the reporter can't put down emotion. So as long as your words are good, your record's in your favor. Again, always know where you're at. Always have all the tools around you. 
And if you really want to watch a movie that, in my opinion, defines what's being a criminal defense attorney more than any other movie, it's My Cousin Vinny. Because in My Cousin Vinny, he doesn't know procedure, he doesn't know law, he's screwing up all over the place and getting criticized. And then at the moment, when the prosecutor tries to utilize a dirty trick and brings an expert in at the last second, and Vinny's able to make a really good objection, and the judge says it's a well-stated objection, what does the judge do? Deny. So all the rules of the procedure didn't help Vinny. And how does Vinny win the case? Because he had knowledge about car mechanics and knew that he did have an expert right there that nobody saw. He stayed calm, he was thinking on his feet, and there's got to be a little bit of part of you that basically says when you see the fences closing in, screw it. I'm going to get through it. And that's what my cousin Vinny did. And that's why I typifies it. And if you ever watched the movie, My Tale, Tales of the Grim Sleeper, you will see me going off on the judge at one moment. And I went off on the judge at that moment because I saw the fences being closed in. I saw what was going to happen three weeks from then. And therefore, I knew I had to make my stand now because I would have nothing in the future. And I had the strength of knowing it and knowing how far I can push. Watch your audience. When the bailiff took one step towards me, I knew, calm down a little bit. You know, I am always acting in the courtroom. Not always outside the courtroom. My passion gets the better of me at times. But inside the courtroom, if I'm passionate, I'm doing it for a reason. I'm trying to get attention for my client. Okay, we are at 150. I think that um, covers our time limit. So, unless there's any other questions, I think I'm going to say thank you to everybody and conclude our initial distinguished speakers. Okay, everybody have a good day. Thank you so much, Mr. Amster. I think we all could say that we appreciate your time and appreciate the presentation. All right, thank you. All right. Thank you, Seymour. Yeah, thank you, You're Mr. welcome. Amster. Thank you, everybody. I know all you are on here. And it's cool. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, all right, I want to do this formalized, so I'm going to end the meeting now and have a good day. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.